by Kelly, and she's going to talk about uh, lessons learned from the SS3 SIM project um, on basically um, hosting and um, maintaining the code. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so the last three or four talks have stole, well, first it was like 90% of my thunder, then 10%, and I kind of have nothing left. But my husband told me, just don't ramble, and I'll be fine. So I'm going to give away uh, my two take-home messages right at the beginning. Number one, sharing is caring. And number two, strive for crayon. And I don't think that those two things have been emphasized quite enough throughout the conference. So I hope to hit them home here at the end. Uh, so I think we strive for too perfect all the time. So 2.5% of surveyed companies actually complete 100% of their projects successfully. It's not very good, but you have to take what you get along the road to what equals success. So when I moved from being a grad student, when I could just sit in the lab or at my home on my computer by myself and make things perfect and tell my husband and my kids to leave me alone. And then I was able to send an email to Andre and I had a completed unit. That doesn't happen now that I have a job. I have to produce things for other people to use. And if I don't produce something, then they have to produce something. And it will probably be smaller if we don't all work together. So just because I don't think it's finished doesn't mean that it's not good. And that was a really, really hard lesson for me to learn. I wanted to just sit and work on things until it was quote unquote perfect. I didn't want people to see my ugly like scrambly code. I thought that if I got user messages that said that they found an error that I was doing something terrible and I just had a really, really poor look on getting positive user feedback. And one day my husband told me a story about his work where people would call in and they'd be asking for a product and then they would, uh, the person taking the phone call would hang up the phone and then they would repeat that conversation to the person sitting next to them. And it was always, not always, but the large majority of the time in a negative uh, connotation, their voice. The way that they retold that story made the other person sound terrible. So he would move into their office and then repeat exactly what they had just said in some like insane sing-song voice that you would hear on like Barney or something like that. And he was like, this is the exact same thing that you just said, but I said it in a positive tone. Why can't we interpret users or customers phone calls in that way? And so I'm not sure if the people answering the phones changed their mentality, but I tried to change my mentality a little bit after listening to that story. So GitHub messages that say that somebody found an error or somebody coming into my office telling me that what I produced wasn't working for them. Like the last talk, I try to use that to move forward rather than thinking that I've done something bad because I've done something positive by putting the software, what I've been working on out there for everybody to use. And that was a really, really hard lesson for me to learn. So. Hopefully sharing is caring, let's, you know, put it out there and also interpret user feedback as positive, not negative. So uh, in order to get to success, I think there's three steps. Henry Ford had this quote where coming together is just the beginning, which that's what we're doing here. Keeping together is progress. We've had that with multiple CAPMs uh, year after year. But success comes from working together. And so I'm gonna share a story uh, that I had a beginning, made some progress, and then uh, I deem is a success. You submitted the manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the story, uh, I'll go into each one of these three um, modules. I have a new word. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, so 
The beginning was in 2013, where Andre told me that if I did some work, I could go somewhere cool. So I was like, okay, I'll do some work, along with some other grad students at UW. And none of us got a PhD chapter out of any of this work, not a single one. And there, I think there were like eight of us. Um, right, yes, multiple papers, no PhD chapters. It's okay. I told myself that it was okay to work on side projects during my PhD. Uh, I might have taken that a little bit too far, but I don't think that I did on this one. The uh, SS3 SIM project shaped my career more than I ever thought or more than anybody could have ever predicted. When I hated my PhD, I found myself coding on SS3 SIM because I liked it. So then in a cutthroat PhD world, I became okay with not having the math background or the desire to go find a new distribution. Go put that on someone else. I, I don't wanna do it. I'm fine with not doing it and it doesn't make me bad. Give me some code that has a bug and I will try to find the answer. And it's what I like. My husband calls it the black screen of death when he walks by my computer and he sees DOS window commands and Sublime with a back, black background and he knows not to bug me. I'm zoned in, I'm doing what I want to do and I really enjoy it. it but it doesn't, like, coding a new distribution is not my mantra. So in 2013, I began this project that uh, led to me I even got to go to a conference that I didn't present at. It was pretty great. And so then if you look at this project over time, uh, we had a lot of commit messages in the beginning and then it was kind of stagnant. And thanks to the collaborative process and Rick allowing one of his contract workers to help me, uh, SS3 SIM, um, which I'll talk about what that actually is, but uh, I was no longer working on it on my own again. In the beginning, it started out with a bunch of grad students. They all got jobs and left, and I was continuing to work on it. And now um, it's a collaborative process again, and it's uh, fun again. And so I kind of pushed other projects aside, just like I did during my PhD, and uh, focused time to make SS3SIM work. And so anyway, uh, I'll go into depth in this later on what I deem why SS3SIM is a success. But this is just as a teaser, this is a commit that I push to R for SS because of an issue on SS3SIM. So uh, I am happy on a daily basis at work, not because I got to the top, which I feel like I'm pretty high for a farm girl from a very small town that has a four-way stop, uh, but because of all the things that I did to get there. So a bit of an overview, I have a cheat sheet for SS3 SIM to hopefully introduce you uh, to it and what it means. I was gonna talk a lot about testing, but I feel like that's pretty much been hammered away. And then um, talk a bit about GitHub and why I think GitHub is a great tool. And then focus on dependencies, which that's where I say strive for CRAN. Um, so this is the SS3SIM cheat sheet. Uh, SS3SIM does three things. It simulates data, it estimates parameters from that data, and then it summarizes your model. And stock synthesis is the model of choice behind this. And then the scenario availability, so the center on the top row, that just talks about the different ways to manipulate your operating and estimation models. So we try to do a lot of stuff behind the scenes and then your users are able to specify I want data in your X, Y, and Z and from this fishery number one and fishery number two and we try to make a simplified way to say how you want to change your operating model and estimation model. 
it relies on stock synthesis, R4SS, and ggplot. So in this black box, this is an entire set of code that you could use to run a simple simulation from start to finish. So you install SS3Sim from CRAN, you specify where it is, that's the uh, object D, and then you run your simulation, that's lines seven through 11, and then get results all writes CSV files to your computer. That led to the plot on the left, which is a direct result, which is one more line of our code that we have, but which is a direct result of just these 12 lines. So people always ask me, well, why should I use it? Why should I use it? We're not grad students anymore. We don't have to code a model from scratch. So SS3Sim doesn't do everything, but that's where like instead of writing all of the background code, like send me a file. Like I'll help get that code that you want, say to manipulate maturity or something along those lines into SS3Sim so that we work together and we work smarter, not harder. I'm not into working harder. So here's part of why I think SS3Sim is a success. The top is the paper explaining SS3SIM, and then I think that there's eight, there might be eight papers here uh, that are all published and used SS3SIM uh, for the simulation where they were trying to answer a question relating to stock assessment. So success, yay yeah, us. Uh, so I'm not sure how much, these might go fast, but testing, uh, as others have said, is really important. Back in the coal mining days, they took a canary down into the mine with them, and if the canary eh, keeled over, then they knew that they needed to leave or they needed to do something. Well, now we can use continuous integration, we can use other packages to help us act as the canary. So um, a blog that I followed, uh, Simon Pitt, he said, you only write code once, but you read it many, 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 many times. So it's not necessarily the writing of the code that's expensive, but the understanding that is. And there's way too many parts of any package to hold all pieces in your mind at one time. So that's why we need 100% test coverage of our packages. Unfortunately, we never really know what 100% is. So if you think you should test it, just test it. Put it there, it's fine. <laughs> so uh, SS3Sim uses the test that package and then also Travis CI and uh, a previous colleague was really instrumental in helping set all that up. And at the moment, everything's green, which is a success, uh, but that's only based off of the tests that you have. So if you're only testing like 50% of your code and it's all green, then it's kind of a false test. But uh, the main goal is that you just continue to add tests. And so just because right now not every single part of SS3Sim is tested using this doesn't mean I'm a failure, and it doesn't mean that it's bad, and it doesn't mean that people shouldn't use it. It just means that, like all of our software, it's in development. And so here is... Um, a poor canary that got put in a bad spot. But what I'd like to advocate is that we should have broken tests. We should be pushing our software to the limit where we're adding new things, we're exploring things. If we don't have broken tests, that just means that we're not adding things to our code. Maybe that might be extreme, but that's a, okay. It's just one way to look at it. So broken tests aren't bad. It doesn't mean we're doing terrible work. It just means that we need to change some things. We need to look at some things. And we're doing our job. We're exploring new options. And so I don't necessarily see broken tests as bad things, but just another thing to put on my to-do list. Um, so now hosting, uh, multiple people have talked about 
the use of GitHub issues. And uh, so here's just an example. We had a pretty trained user of SS3SIM that put an issue out there. And then obviously people respond, we fix the issue. But uh, Ian made me aware of the fact that we have international users that are posting issues, which is a bit of a milestone, or I thought it was, that uh, we have people out there that are using the code beyond the people that I could push it on. So like, you know, if I saw a new postdoc, I'm like, hey, this can help you. You know, that's super easy. But if somebody else is just word of mouth and using it because they heard that it works or they saw it in a paper, I think that that's another success. Um, this is just a schematic on how we have a master branch that's always updated to CRAN and then a development branch. And I never update. Now my new gold standard is don't update master unless I've pushed master to CRAN. So any GitHub user will always see the same thing on master and CRAN and all development is done on branches that are pushed to development. And I've had a bit of pushback from this, like, GitHub is easy, let's just put it there. Well, it makes my life easier if I know I can pass CRAN checks because then I'm not gonna get as many emails on this doesn't install, I don't know how to use this, this isn't working. So it's not necessarily that I think pulling a package from CRAN is what you have to do, but I think striving for being able for it to be on CRAN is really where we should be going towards. Uh, so I was hoping that this page would be updated, but I'm still waiting for CRAN because I got an email that looks like this, which I could have interpreted in that terrible, the world is, you know, crashing, but I just, oh, I have a few things I need to do. Uh, and then I pushed it again and they told me I needed to wait at least five days before I emailed them again. That's fine. So, uh, I really believe that um, I don't necessarily write the good, the best code, but I've gotten real good at stealing good code. And so these are the three major dependencies of SS3SIM. And uh, I like to think that I'm working together with all of these uh, people and not just by myself on my own computer. And then back to my major success was that I help Ian, or at least I think I help Ian, with R4SS by committing or doing a pull request to him when I have a problem, instead of just pirating his code and putting it in mine. I have R4SS as a dependency. Anytime I need to expand, then I just help him with his code instead of just working by myself. So. That's a measured success. And then here's a plug for uh, on Tuesday, Claudio Castillo-Jordan, a postdoc at the Northwest Fishery Science Center is using SS3SIM and he'll be, oh, well, sorry, Andres. Andres claiming him. Um, he'll be giving a presentation that's uh, on, Go to meeting on Tuesday and his project uses SS3SIM where the final presentation will be at CAPM in 2020. So sharing is caring and we should strive for CRAN. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. We have quite a bit of time for questions. Does anyone have a question? Uh-oh, help me out. <laughs> so can you explain um, what the difference is between SS3SIM and SS simulation inside SS? And um, is there any differences in the way you're managing those projects? Uh, the second one being the SSMSE, is that, or? Oh, no. Oh, okay, the bootstrap simulator within stock synthesis. So uh, our um, claim to fame on why you should use SS3SIM is that we allow different 
data structures than your input data. So if you have length bins uh, on a five centimeter basis, we can re-bin that to 10 centimeters or two centimeters, however uh, you specify. So you can change the data structure. Uh, and the other option is that there's multiple distributions besides the distribution that like the multinomial. So we have Drusle sampling and some other things, but the main thing is just changing the sampling relative to the bootstrap simulator. Andre. How robust is this to changing SS itself? I mean, how, in, in your, I mean from a design point of view, how, how linked is this to the actual, you know, for example, how much stress did you go through from 3.24 to 3.3, or dare I say from a non-spatial to a spatial model? Right, so that was a learning curve for me in that in the very beginning as grad students, we didn't know that r for ss was going to continue. And we failed to actually ask. Ian sat in the same room as us, gave us some tutorials, gave us lots of help, um, other people from the Northwest Center, but we never blatantly asked, is this a project that's gonna keep going? We just assumed that it wasn't. So in the beginning, we did a lot of rewriting and of r for ss code or just doing it in our own way instead of looking at the r for ss package and in the end the major heavy lift going from 3.24 to 3.3 is we just changed it to use r for ss so then it's ian's problem yeah matthew yes <clears throat> so you mentioned that uh you you uh commit the cram that's one of your test cases. Is that because um, you can't get the same test coverage from any GitHub services? Or is that just a solution you came up with? You probably could, but I haven't put in the time or the effort to uh, set up the Travis CI in that way. But the main thing is that I'm a Windows user. And so it ensures to me that a Mac user can install my package. So, uh, okay, so I have a follow-up because I'm getting ready to do some of this CRAM stuff too. What, what kind of tests do they run? They run a lot of dependency tests. So like other uh, people, if their package depends upon yours, they'll double check that your new package doesn't break the functions in downward dependencies. And then they also ensure that upward dependencies, so like ggplot, that I um, am using the correct version and those types of things. So more like the, the inner workings between packages that I don't necessarily have checks for in my test that uh, workflow. Because I just am doing only tests on my own where they do more expansive ones. Is that why you can only uh, commit every five days? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if um, you knew of someone who was working on some project that was kind of a bit similar to SS3 sim and, and who uh, perhaps cares and shares in a different way, whether you would encourage them to um, uh, incorporate that within your project. And no, I'm not thinking of you, Andre. Well, maybe I am. I talked to Andre earlier this week, actually, and uh, he was talking about spatial and other features and he's already emailed me the files that he wrote and to incorporate into ss3 sim <laughs> okay so um related to generating the next generation stock assessment model um in your experience um why is your approach better in the sense that you're doing a completely separate package that links to stock synthesis rather than building on the simulator within SS and whether there's a need for both packages at the same time, you know, both types of approaches at the same time. Well, answer the question, the answer is process error. So bootstrap can't do process. No, but you can easily do process error in stock synthesis. You just have to that's 
the bootstrap in SS, even if your model has process error, the only thing that's going to get bootstrapped is the observation error. And so, you know, you, you need something like this in order to do the process error aspect of uh, generating better random data sets. Now, there is an augmentation that, you know, could be considered, uh, and that is the nature of the detailed sampling process. Because, I mean, like I said, SS is sampling just the observation uh, error, which is basically taking an expected value for a length or an age vector and resampling from that. SS3SIM is doing the same thing. It just is using a few more distributions, but it's still sampling from that final derived expected value vector. The better way, the, you know, the more complete, I don't know if it's better, but the more complete way to do it would be to do the sampling at the age length sample step. Um, so, you know, in the flow of SS, there is a uh, step where the population is sampled, selectivity is applied to the population, cues applied to it, and so you get a sampled age length at a point in time and for a given fleet. And that then could be the basis for subsequent sampling and processing to create uh, random values, because now you have access to the full age and length dimensions and it's before aging error has been applied. So if you wanted to do a com more complete job, if you really wanted to sample uh, the conditional age at length stuff more correctly, uh, more completely, uh, I think you would need to do it at that level. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something I think that could be considered. I think another benefit of SS3 SIM or packages like that are the visualization afterwards. And so to easily take and do quick comparisons of the operating model to the estimation model. So if you had the sampler, you know, you would still need external packages to visualize it. Yeah, Brian. Uh, someone working on a package that's based on TMB that has the simulate functionality that Anders mentioned. Um, so you talked about three components, simulate, estimate, and then summarize. In that case, is it mostly that third component of summarizing that could potentially use stuff from this with a package that was using the TMB simulate feature? Or is there other stuff in the simulate estimate phase? Is that, that specific to SS and wouldn't it be portable to another package? Uh, my guess would be that what we have is not super sophisticated. It's more like ggplot is portable. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, Andre. Yeah, I, I think the one thing that we're missing here is, I mean, obviously you could create, if, if there was an R for SS, you can, you can create R for, uh, R for dub WAM basically, because you're linking in those libraries. But I think the thing that really, why I created my own semi or SS threesome was I wanted process error in things that the estimator had ignored. So I, w I had spatial models where most of the spatial models ignore uh, local spatial recruitment deviations, right? So when you estimate, you assume that the proportion of recruitment to each area is constant. That's just the way the estimate. But when I wanted to simulate, I wanted my operating model to have that. So in, in SS, speak, what I did was I created a PAR file that I could use SS as essentially a projection model to generate my expected values, which I then added, we're well, using the bootstrap actually, added my errors. So I was able to test much more complicated operating models than I would put as an estimator. Um, and I think that concept is beneficial to, to everyone. So the, generating the observations is great, but it's being able to, to create models that are more complicated than you might necessarily simulate from. And it's a hell of a lot more fun than rewriting stock synthesis. Right? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, um, okay, back to the, I think it's the, the 
more of a question for uh, the everyone else. I'm not as ex I don't have any experience with TMB. Um, with all that integration into um, R and TMB, like the R is so integral with TMB, is it something where we can have more opportunity in the future to sort of blend these R functions in? I know for the SS uh, MSE projects and that, we've talked a lot about what's R and what's um, inside SS, and they're sort of separate with trade-offs, but is there any um, capacity in TMB more so than ADMB to interact and we can sort of build in SS3 sim and build in R for SS directly into these uh, models in the future? I'm not sure. I think I would ask Brian and Anders a bit because I haven't used the simulator with inside TMB. But one thing I think that I have a question that relates to that is based on Andre's comment, how, if you have them built in, how do you ever sample something more complicated than what's there? You do the same thing that I did in TMB. Inside of TMB? Yeah, thanks to a routine that Anders gave me only two days ago. Essentially, you can use it as a projection model. So basically, you give it random parameters, run the model forward once, and you get the expected values, and then you generate from them. I, I think, you, in fact, with that routine, you've got a lot more than, than it'll be so much cleaner because you don't have to call synthesis. You just call, give me function which is n by age or whatever you want. It's yeah, that's a, if, if that really works as well as it looks like, it is going to make this so much simpler. Yeah, so, so the simulation feature in GMB is specifically built for simulating from the model you're estimating from. And spe especially that uh, check consistency checker checks that you actually simulate from the model that you estimated from. Um, and that, and that's, that by itself is a super useful feature. If you want to, I'm not sure I understand why, but if you want to, you can simulate other stuff from other stuff that's not part of the model or extra variation or something. You can do it from inside the C file if you want to, but you could just as easily do it from R, I guess. But but it might there might be cases where it's simpler to use part of the predictions from from within the C code. But um, I've I've not done that. But there there is no tell. You, you're not told what to simulate, so you can in principle simulate whatever you want from in there. Okay, I think we should uh, move on. Thank you, Kelly.